Today we're going to do tacos, and I'm going to show you how to turn all this into this. I've got 10 tacos in here with all the fixings, it's vacuum packed, and most importantly, the taco shells have not been crushed. I'm Evan Rowell, and this is Critical Thinking. Okay, the first thing I want to do is I want to explain to you that this isn't going to be for everybody because this is very intensive preparation how to do tacos, okay? Now, I've done enough ingredients here to do 70 tacos and 40 tostadas, okay? But all you have to do is, is take what I'm doing here and cut it down to your own liking. As a matter of fact, um, I've already done the meat for the tacos and the tostadas and, and freeze dried everything else. I've, I've been working at this for over a month. But the problem that I had was how to put tacos, shells, into a container that I could vacuum pack without crushing the taco shells. And I've come up with an idea. You may or may not want to do it, but this is how I've chosen to do it because we're talking about tacos here. Come on. I know people that would eat tacos three times a day every day if they could. But uh, nobody, including me, especially me, likes to open up a package of taco shells and find out that they've been crushed or they're cracked or something else like that and you end up making taco salad. Okay, so I've come up with a way to protect them and um, so stick with me and I'll show you how it's done. Okay, so the first thing I've got here is I want to talk about is the meat. I've got um, four pounds of 90-10 of meat here, which means it's 90% lean and 10% fat. Now I could go all the way up to 97% um, lean and 3% fat if, if I wanted to pay $7 a pound for it. Still, this is over $6 a pound, but you know, a lot of people will go, well, I'm just going to go down and I'm going to use regular ground beef, maybe the, um, the epitome of regular, which is 27.73, which means it's only 73% uh, lean ground beef. And what that means is that you've got 25% fat in that meat. Now, for some things, you know, that's okay. That's what you want. You, you, this, this hamburger right here is not good for making a juicy hamburger because that fat um, has a lot of the flavor and has a lot of the moisture and everything in it. But then again, it's not lean. But for this project, whenever I freeze dry something, I usually opt for the 90-10. Fact of the matter is, you're going to pay about the same price when it comes down to the content of the lean meat. Because when you cook regular ground beef, you're going to lose 15% of the weight of that meat in moisture. Okay, and on top of that, you're going to have over 25% of what's left is going to be fat. And so dollar for dollar, when you're um, figuring out how, what you want to spend your money on, I prefer something that's a little on the higher end of the lean rather than to go to the lower end because I think even with 10% fat, you're still getting that juiciness, you're still getting that flavor, you're still getting everything you need. And also, I did a little research on this, and by and large, People that you talk to and articles that you read will talk about how regular ground beef isn't that much different than, than lean ground beef as far as protein content and as far as, um, you know, how desirable it is. Uh, but frankly, I don't trust it, okay? I know what is called pink slime, okay? And what that is, and, and you know, that's, that's not really a... <laughs> That's not really a good name or a fair name, I should say, to call this stuff. It is beef, but it, what it is is they'll take the undesirable cuts of beef that they can't sell, they can't chop up, and they, you know, it, it's like mostly the underbelly of the cow, and they will process it, and they will grind it, and um, they will grind it into a very fine kind of a goo. It is meat protein. Uh, there's, as of yet, there's no additives in it, uh, supposedly. But did you ever wonder how it is that they get that fat content in that uh, hamburger so precise? 73, 27 is, is pretty standard. And how do they do that? They'll take cuts of meat 
and they'll grind it into hamburger and then they will add this it's, it's a binding agent it's uh, it's meat protein but it is like clay it's like really thin clay and they'll add that in until they can get the exact amount of fat versus lean meat in that hamburger now I know there's a lot of government regulations that say you're not supposed to put additives you're not supposed to put water you're not supposed to put anything except for maybe a little bit of flavoring in your meat but quite frankly it's been my experience that the FDA just doesn't have the resources to be everywhere all the time I think some of the hamburger that you get will have fillers in it. They will have oatmeal or, or, or bread grains or even quinoa or rice or something put in there. And that will also hold on to moisture. That's one of the reasons that when you cook hamburger, you will lose so much moisture. Granted, most of that is coming out of the fat, but you're, you, you're losing a lot of water. So when you cook the lower grades of hamburger, you're going to lose a lot of the weight, okay? And so what you're left with in lower grade hamburger versus the higher grade hamburger is going to be about the same when it comes to meat protein content. And uh, that grocer, he's not stupid, okay? He's going to get his money out of that meat one way or another. As a matter of fact, one of the things that, that really makes me wonder, and I've seen reports on this on um, Google and, and other places, where even on 60 Minutes, I believe there was one, where they talked about how uh, butchers will take meat that's nearing its expiration date or becoming a little off color, and that's what they'll use in their hamburger. So I usually grind my own hamburger, but if I'm going to buy it, it's always the 90-10. Okay, anything less than that, I just don't trust. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to cook this hamburger. I'm going to put it in this pan, and I'm, I'm just going to cook it down, okay? Now, I'm not here to waste your time letting you watch me dump this into there and chop it all up and make small talk and everything. So we're going to, we're going to jump ahead. I'm going to go screen to screen to screen here. So I'm going to put this in the pan, and I'm also going to add to it these chopped onions, okay? Now, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to put any taco sauce in this one. In this batch, I did. The taco sauce is right in the meat. But I've decided that on this batch, I'm going to go ahead and cook the meat. And when I package it, I'm going to put the taco sauce in the package and let the end user decide how much of that taco sauce they want to put in the end meat. Because I like to put it in a little bit strong. Uh, somebody else may not like to do that. So with that, I'm going to put this hamburger now and I'm going to get it cooking. Okay, now this meat is thoroughly cooked. You don't want to overcook it, okay? You want it brown. You want the internal temperature to get up to, I'm not sure what it is. It's supposed to be 165 or 175 degrees. But uh, you don't want to brown it, okay? All, I mean, not brown it. You don't want to uh, crust it. You don't want to fry it or anything. But there's still some moisture in there that needs to come out. So with that, we're going to go ahead and take the pan and I'm going to dump it into this strainer and I'm going to rinse it with hot water okay so we'll just take that and dump that hamburger right into here okay that's all of it and that oily water and everything is has gone through the bottom okay you can see it there is dripping out you can um, all that oil and that stuff and so now we want to take hot water and we want to start to rinse this off and you can see that we're going to get a lot of grease a lot of oil and a lot of other stuff that's going to be coming out the bottom okay I want to mix this around to make sure that I get a good clean um, hamburger content and get rid of that oil but that water is really hot and when I'm done, there will be very little, if any, oil left on that. So we'll continue to mix this around. And I will do this until that water coming out the bottom is fairly clean. Because then I know that I've got minimum fat in there. And that's not too bad. You're still going to get a little bit of brown. But um, that's just going to be from the meat itself um, forcing its way through the bottom of the strainer. But I think that's about good enough. 
I've been doing that for a few minutes and we'll let it drain and then I'll transfer it back into the pot. Okay, back into here. Turn that heat up a little bit and then put in the onions. And I like to use a lot of onions and you know, the fact of the matter is, you don't have to put the onions in it, okay? If you want to freeze dry the onions and keep them off to the side, some people will do that. But I prefer my onions to be cooked and freeze dried right into the meat. And you mix it around. You want to let those onions cook just a little bit. I like the onions to be a little bit firm. So I'll mix that around. Now, at this point, I would usually take the taco seasoning mix, which I have right here, and I'd follow the instructions on the back, and I would season the meat. But I'm not going to do that this time. I did with these, but I'm not going to do that this time. I'm just going to put these packages in that mylar bag along with everything else. So this meat right here is pretty much ready to go. Okay, now what, I, what else that I really want to do is I'm going to put a little bit of salt and pepper in it. Okay. And for me, there's a world of difference between um, pepper you get in a can and stuff that you grind fresh. I mean, there is, there's a, a very much a different flavor. Okay. And now I'm ready to put this into, move this out of the way here, into one of my freeze dryer pans. Okay, turn that off. Get a spoon and a pan. And I'm going to fill up a pan and this is going to go right into the freezer. Now, this should fill this pan just about completely full. So give me a minute here and I'll get this transferred. Okay, so as you can see, uh, that five pounds of meat filled up about um, maybe almost one and a half pans or trays. Okay, so these are going to go into the freezer as soon as they cool off a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set these over here. And uh, they're going to go into the freezer here in just a little bit. So the next thing I want to get started on is the fajita meat. What I have here is a four pound chuck roast. And I'm going to slice it up into the finger strips that will go on fajitas when the time comes. So give me just a little bit and I will get this done. And I'm going to cut it into about maybe a little less than half an inch thick pieces. And we'll go from there. Okay, so give me a little while and I'll take care of that. Okay, I've got this cut up into pieces good enough for fajita or a tostada. Um, maybe a half an inch square, a couple inches long. And as you can see, I cut off quite a bit of the fat. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to transfer this into this pot. Again, I'm going to cook it just the same way um, that I cooked the hamburger. And I will rinse it off once it's done. So let me get to that point. Um, there's nothing exciting about what I'm going to do between right now and, and getting it into the pan. I'm just going to cook the meat. Okay, I'm not going to add any onions. I'm not going to add any spices. I'm not going to add anything. Okay, so let me get to that point. All right, I, I cooked that meat. I, and it turned out rather well. I really like the way it, uh, it browned up and everything. But I got to wondering how much um, weight I lost in the process. So here's the label off of that pack, the chuck roast. It weighed 3.87 pounds, okay, almost four pounds. 
it was six sixty-seven a pound, almost almost twenty-six dollars for that thing. But anyhow, so here I think I'm getting a four-pound roast. And let's go ahead and take the actual measurement. First thing we'll do is here's the fat that I cut off of it. I put it in this bag. The weight of the bag is negligible, but uh, that fat is about seven ounces. Okay, so we took. Uh, almost a half a pound of fat off of that so that would bring the weight down to about three point uh, three point three seven so I'm going to tear this pan and I'm going to weigh that one and we're going to and I'm going to tell you exactly how much meat we actually put on that pan so that's teared to zero all right exactly one and a half pounds Okay, now if that meat, when it went into the pan without its fat, weighed 3.3 pounds, this meat has lost almost 2 pounds of its weight. Okay, don't, I'm not going to try to explain how that is, but that is 1 pound 8 ounces in meat. And then the chuck roast started out at 3 pounds, uh, 3.87 pounds. So you lose a lot of weight, okay? When you're, when you're trying to figure out how much meat you're going to buy to, to fill up these pans um, and you want to put 2.5 pounds of meat in there, I always buy 150% more meat uh, than I think I should have in the pan because the cooking process, you're going to lose a lot of weight. Now, just for the heck of it, let's go ahead and re-tear this to make sure it's on zero. It wasn't quite there. Okay, there's zero. Now I know I had exactly five pounds of meat on this whole thing. This pan right here is almost two pounds. It's just a, less than an ounce shy of two pounds. Okay, now considering that we started out with five pounds, let's see how much that is. That is two ounces, that's 14 ounces, so that's almost one pound. So you got three pounds, uh, a little less than three pounds in that entire uh, hamburger there, and that's including two large onions that I put in there. So you can be sure we lost more than two pounds of, um, well, actually, let's see, uh, three pounds, no, two. Two. Okay, it started out as five and now it's almost three, but with that onion weight in there, you can be sure we lost a little more than two pounds in moisture and, and whatever else. So you're going to lose a lot when it comes to how much weight uh, and actual meat that you have on the tray. Okay, so with that, we're going to go ahead and move on. Okay, next we want to talk about the tomatoes. Now the tomatoes are real simple. They're just simply tomatoes that I've diced up and the one thing that I do with tomatoes that I think makes a big difference when I'm uh, putting tomatoes in salads and tacos and stuff like that is after I cut them I rinse the seed and that gelatinous body out from the tomato. Now look at this picture. You can see this after the tomato has been sliced it's, uh, you can see the, those seeds and that gelatinous center and everything. I don't like to freeze dry that, okay? So what I do is I rinse them off after they've been sliced. I'm very careful to pull off all the, the, the insides, leaving nothing but the meat of the, uh, the tomato. And here's a picture of what it looks like after it's been rinsed off. And then from there, you simply slice it up and cut it up and dice it up and you end up with um, these diced the tomatoes. And what I'll do is seeing how that meat didn't fill up a pan and a half like I thought it might, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to dump these uh, diced up tomatoes in the other half of this pan right next to that meat. And those will freeze dry really, really well. Okay, so that'll go into the freezer. Now I've got one pan left, and um, although there's more to the tacos than what I have here, I've got, you know, 
the iceberg lettuce, I got the cheese, I got the sauce or whatnot. What I want to do is I want to take this. These are homemade dividers and uh, they're made out of uh, aluminum and I cut slots in them so they'd fit in like that. The first thing that I want to do is I had, I had some paper here. Okay, I found that piece of paper. Uh, it's just a piece of parchment paper. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to cut it a little bit because I want to put it on this divider to prevent the sauce that I'm going to put in one side from bleeding over into the uh, into the lettuce that I'm going to put in the other side. So this will fold up like that and this one will we fold up like that. And I'm going to start, however, I'm going to start with the lettuce. Now, this is actually the first time, other than this here, this is the first project where I have ever used iceberg lettuce. And the reason for that is I do kale, I do spinach, I do other leafy greens all the time, but they usually end up coming out so brittle and so hard that we crush them or process them up into, process them up into um, um, powders and use them in fruit smooth or in uh, vegetable drinks, <coughs> smoothies. So because there's not a whole lot of nutritional value in these, except for I like this on tacos. I never have freeze dried it before and I was very pleasantly surprised at how it turned out. Now, um, just about everybody knows how you get rid of a core in the salad. You slam it down, it breaks the core and the core will pop out and then you can do what you want with the salad. You don't want to do that. Uh, when you're going to freeze dry the salad because you have to cut that head up and if it's been loosened because you slammed it down to get rid of that core then it's going to fall apart on you. So what I do is I, I do get rid of the core but I cut it out because I don't want to loosen up. There. There's that and get rid of a little bit more of it right there. Okay, so now that I've got that stripped and I've got the core pulled out of it, I'm going to want to prep it for freeze drying. And what I do is I simply cut it into three quarter inch pieces. Okay, just like that. And you can lay them into there. See, they're nice, they're nice and thick, but this is, remember, this is lettuce. There isn't any reason that you should want to worry about this. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Let's put this one over here. Put one more. You can go ahead and press this into there. Make sure that it goes in nice and tight. And now I don't have a space in there for another full piece. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to cut this one in half like this and I'm going to set it right in here. And this should be plenty of lettuce for the number of tacos and whatever else that I need to do this uh, little project with. Okay, that's all the lettuce you need. Um, we'll go ahead and I'll save this. I'll use it in a sandwich or something, but uh, that's plenty of lettuce for this project. Now, the other thing that most people are surprised to find out you can do, and this is the reason I put this divider and paper in here, is I got taco sauce right here, and taco sauce will dry very nicely. As a matter of fact, there is some of the results of what I'm about to do. It dries up and it reconstitutes very well. But this is just the La Victoria brand. Comes straight out of the bottle. Nothing fancy about it. And I pour it into these two squares here. 
and those two squares will take that whole bottle. So there you have it. This is all ready to go into the freeze dryer and I'm going to go ahead and do that and then when, we, when I come back we're going to talk about how we handle the taco shells. So give me a few minutes, all this needs to go into the freeze dryer or the, uh, into my freezer so that it can go into the freeze dryer here in about maybe six hours after being completely frozen in my, chest, in my uh, upright freezer. Okay, so give me a minute. Okay, now that those four trays have been tucked safely into my freezer, um, here's where things start getting a little bit weird, okay? And what I mean by that is I have taken taco shells, and anybody that knows anything about taco shells knows that they will crack very, very easily. And considering the fact that I'm wanting to put them in a vacuum pack that um, is capable of crushing steel cans, you realize and recognize how um, careful you have to be with taco shells if you want them to remain whole. And I thought about it and I thought about it and I, I went down to Walmart and I bought some of those uh, Rubbermaid containers, you know, they're inexpensive, and uh, it just didn't work. Any vacuum at all and they would crush and you can hear it. You start to put the vacuum on there and you hear these things going crackle, snap, crackle, and pop. You just know that, that they're crushing. And so I was never able to achieve with any kind of plastic container the vacuum that I, I needed to achieve or I wanted to achieve. Now, you might say, Evan, what do you mean? Why did you feel that you needed to put a vacuum? Why don't you just not put a vacuum on it at all? Well, the reason being is unless you're very careful just handling a bag like this, with taco shells in it rattling around in there, they're going to bust up and they're going to crack up and, and they're going to fall to pieces. Now, since I did this, I did think that if you used a Rubbermaid container and packed the shells in it real gingerly with um, paper towels or something, then you could put it in a package, a Mylar package, and, uh, and then put all the other bags of uh, you know, ingredients in there that you need seal it up with a good oxygen absorber, maybe 300 cc's in a bag that size, and, and it would be fine as long as those taco shells or tostadas or whatever you want to use um, don't, aren't able to hit up against anything and uh, have a shockwave crack them up. And even with this idea, I had that happen, um, so I had to be very, very careful. As a matter of fact, here's the result of a set of taco shells that I had put in one of these and I drew a vacuum that was a lot tighter than that and this this top here actually began to concave on from both sides and I heard it and my heart just sank and I, oh for heaven's sakes I just I just ruined them tacos so I had to take them back out and uh, and redo them put new tacos in there but what I've done is I has actually had somebody at work these are the tostadas right here I actually had somebody at work suggest this to me and he says, Evan, you know those foam tubes that they use to make cement pillars with? Um, they're very thin and they're very rigid. And I'm going to show you here what I'm talking about. You can buy this at any hardware store. It's usually 48 inches long. It's very thin, but it is very, very rigid. And what I did was I cut, you can see the line here. I cut two and a quarter inch rings off of this that ended up looking like this or, or like this one right here. And then I took um, some one eighth inch masonite board and I cut open or I cut out these little pieces right here. And there were two of them for each one of these so that they would sit on each side. And then I used a hot glue gun to um, to glue one side on, okay? And then I put in the bottom of that, I put four layers of paper towels, and then I was able to put the 10 tostadas in here, and then I put this ring of paper towels around the outside of it to protect it from moving back and forth, and then I put four layers on top of it. Okay, push those edges down. And then I use hot glue to glue the top of this 
onto there, and that's what protects my tostadas. Now, and, and you'll notice if I shake this around, it's that nothing's moving inside of there. Okay, my taco shells are the same way. I was able to put uh, do the same thing, but I put five in there back to back like this. So I put five there, five there on top of that paper towel. And then because there's a kind of a valley there, I put some paper towel across that valley and then across the top. And then when the top goes on, it gets hot glued on. And again, those tacos do not move and they are in a hard case. That's if you do it just right, if you know just exactly how much to do it, you can put a pretty good vacuum on there without crushing your, your taco shells. Now, this is the way I do it because I'm kind of fanatical when it comes to freeze drying and packaging. I love a challenge and for me this was a challenge and this is how I came up with it. You don't have to do this. You can put your brain to work and, and try to figure out your own way of being able to package taco shells and make sure that they can undergo the rigors of being tossed around or the rigors of a vacuum pack or something like that and um, without without cracking up and on the tops of these I write of course 10 taco shells and then what I do is I'll put a piece I'll take this um, hot glue gun and my wife has just done run off with it but uh, I'll put a little bit of hot glue right here and a little bit of hot glue right here just run right there and right there just a dab and then down here where I have this arrow pointing, it, it says, use a knife to gently pry open this corner. And I'll put a uh, dab of hot glue right there. And then I won't put any on this side. So that when somebody uses a knife to pry open this corner, and it does pop up with a little bit of effort, not much, uh, it will pop up. And then these two back will just, this, the lid will come right off. And then once that hot glue is on there, I set it on here. I press it down until the hot glue sets and what I end up with I end up being able to put these in a bag now once that's done um, as a matter of fact let's here's for the for the tacos I use the taco meat I've got cheese okay this is grated cheese if you're gonna freeze dry cheese it has to be grated I've got sour cream Okay, and I have the instructions on each bag on how to reconstitute it. Plus, I'll have a full-size instruction sheet that'll take you through step-by-step -step how to do all of this. So, with that, I've also got the taco sauce. I got the tomatoes, and I've got the lettuce. Now, lettuce. This was something that really surprised me. This lettuce did not come out crispy like other green vegetables will leafy greens well it almost came out well it was soft okay and so I thought wow I had no idea that this would do this but I took some of it and I tossed it in water to see how well it would reconstitute I was hoping it would turn right back into its crispy cold self I was sure to put cold water and uh, with you know even with ice in it and the lettuce went limp I mean it went absolutely soggy absolutely something you wouldn't want to put on a taco shell so I did some experimentation and what I stumbled upon was something that would bring the lettuce back to almost not quite what you'd want to have in a tossed salad but really well enough for a taco and that's to take a spritzer some cold water in a spray bottle and then put this in a dish and spray cold water on it and then toss it around and spray cold water on it again and toss it around. Now, I'd, I'd do that for you, but I, I don't have enough, unfortunately, to show you. But if you'll do that, I mean, you'll know it when you toss it around till it reaches a consistency or a rehydration point to where you can pick it up and put it on a taco. Okay, and so what I've done is to make sure that somebody has a spritzer is I went down to Walmart you see this little bottle right here? 78 cents. So I bought a bunch of these. I bought about 11 or 12 of them. And I'm putting one in each bag of lettuce. 
And that way, when somebody wants to rehydrate this lettuce, they've got this inexpensive little spritzer in here they can fill with ice water. And all that will be on the instructions. When I put the instruction sheet in there, this little bit of ice water on um, this lettuce, and you, you will be able to reconstitute this lettuce back to the point where it'll do halfway, you know, it's, it's not going to be perfect, but it will really suffice. So that's what's going to go in the, um, the tacos. In the tostadas, I have, of course, the tostada meat, and this has the seasoning in it, so we don't have to, to re-season it. Um, on this one, I've got cheese, and then refried beans, okay? Um, you'll put two cups of water in these refried beans, and refried beans come back really well. You could never tell the difference between uh, pre-freeze-dried and after freeze-dried, reconstituted freeze-dried beans work really, really well. Then I got the onion and pepper blend. Again, none of this is so difficult that you don't know how to freeze dry it. I mean, you, you should know how. You just, you just put it in the pan, stick it in your freeze dryer. Okay, this um, pepper and onion blend I got at the store. It was pre-frozen, great value blend, and bought a couple of big bags and, and tossed them in a pan and put them in the freeze dryer. There's no trick to it. You don't have to do anything to it. And when it came out, I've, I've got um, a bag full. It's enough for, the, uh, um, for 10, at least 10... Uh, tostadas and uh, the instructions will say rehydrating these is easy because meat and uh, meat and vegetables do not really absorb more water than they need at least not if unless you let it sit in there for 24 or 48 hours something like that and then it begins to affect uh, being underwater but uh, so there's that I've got the, again the sour cream and then the paste salsa I did a batch four trays of this paste salsa and it says add two cups of water and knead to mix. Add more water if necessary to achieve desired consistency. So that's what's going to go in the packages with tostada shells, okay, with this one down here. So with that, let me go get the bags set up and prepared, and I'll bring them up here, and I'll pack the bags, show you exactly how it's done. I'll go ahead and heat up the uh, glue gun and get these tops glued on, and we'll go from there. Okay, so here we are. I'm ready to package these up. Uh, one tostada and one taco. I have, uh, I found my glue gun and I glued the tops on these. You shake these around, those uh, tostadas and tacos are not gonna move around in there and they're in a hard container so that they can be vacuum packed. I got uh, two 300 cc oxygen absorbers and I have the instructions for each one. This one, uh, make sure I put the right one in the right one here. This one's for the tacos and this one's for the tostadas. I've got my heat seater. This is my handheld. Um, the reason that I use this handheld is because it's wide enough that it'll do all the way across one of these two and a half gallon bags. And incidentally, I tried to use the large Harvest Right bag, although you can force one of these into it. It doesn't leave any room for anything else that you want to put into it. So I use the two and a half gallon size. And then I've got, of course, my needle vacuum packer here. And so let's go from there. Let's start with tacos. So I have, make sure these are the taco shells. These will go in there. And I tuck it down into the corner. Okay. And then I'll separate out everything else I need for the taco so that I don't inadvertently put the material in that are for the tostadas. The instruction page, now I'll read the instruction page to you. It says, do this first. Sour cream, add one half cup room temperature water to the bag seal and knead. Let sit on counter for one half hour. Add more water if needed. Cut bag corner to expose the small hole by which to squeeze out the sour cream. In other words, the bag becomes the dispenser. Taco meat with seasoning and onions. Place in skillet with 1.5 cups of water. Bring to a slow boil. Reduce heat and simmer until water is reduced and meat is ready to be used. Tomatoes, cover with water until rehydrated and then drain. Taco sauce, add to one half cup plus one tablespoon water and knead to mix. Cheese, and this is kind of important here. Use as is. May be spritzered with water prior to use, but do not attempt to rehydrate. 
Cheese rehydration can take a long time and requires very precise amounts of water. Besides, the flavor is better dry. And it actually is. If you've ever taken dry or dehydrated cheese and ate it, the flavor can be very intense simply because there's no water in there to dilute the flavor of the cheese. And, and I really love it. It's, it's great to snack on. Okay, do this last. Lettuce. Do not submerge in water. It will quickly become soggy. Transfer it to a bowl and use a supplied spritzer to lightly coat lettuce with cold water. Toss and repeat until loosely rehydrated. Lettuce rehydration is not exact. It will never regain its original state. It can be a little tougher than normal, but is quite adequate for this purpose. That's why you probably wouldn't want to use rehydrated lettuce in a tossed salad. Okay, the top of the taco shell container is glued at only three points. Pry where indicated to release a single point and then remove the lid. And what I mean by that is it is glued right where the arrow is. It's glued at this point and this point. It's not glued on this corner. So it's easy to stick a knife under there. You can pry this glue open really easy. It, it'll, it'll let loose of that, uh, that cardboard or that masonite really easy and then it'll just, it'll just pop right off. Okay, so those are the instructions. Those are the next things to go in. And I set those right on top of that. And then I want the oxygen absorber. Let's see, where's my scissors go? Hmm. There it is. Cut those open, take out an oxygen absorber, and put it in there right along with that. Now, the next thing I find is easiest to do is to take the sour cream, roll it up. Now, the top of the sour cream has to remain open because there are no holes in the bag. I put holes in the bag in the rest of them, and I'll put it in there right next to that taco container. The cheese, you do want to put holes in it. You want to close up the top completely, but I'll put a couple of holes in it just so that when I pull the vacuum, it'll pull the vacuum, it'll pull the air out of the cheese. And that's kind of important, otherwise the bag will uh, swell up. And I'll slide it in right next to the sour cream, right into that corner. Okay, the taco sauce is the same way. Make sure you put a couple of holes in it. This only needs two on that one. But it goes all the way through, so you've actually got four holes in it. You roll it up and it too will go in right next to that taco container. Now next, we'll go in the meat. I'll take that, put a couple holes in it. Fold it up a little bit and put it in front of the container. And flatten it down a little bit, okay? The tomatoes, the same way. Come on couple of holes to let air out and I'll put it right next to the meat and then the salad last but not least a couple of holes in that and I will lay that right on top of the tomatoes and the meat now I have everything and I always double check I've got the oxygen absorber I've got the instructions and uh, let's make sure that there's, let's see, that, 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 that. Okay, everything's in here that needs to go in there. These bags are so easy to seal because it always leaves enough room. So, I'll take the heat sealer. Let me see, I'm going to bring it around here. It doesn't take long. That's it. About one and a half seconds. And that is a good seal. The hand heat sealer works on these bags at 160 degrees. No hotter. If it was any hotter, it would actually burn the bag in half. It would just melt the bag. But anyhow, that is a really good seal on that. Now we want to vacuum seal it. This is my needle. This is a meat marinade injector that I've converted with an, a pump. Um, you don't need, actually need a pump. Recently I've got uh, indications from followers that they're able to, if they rig this um, 
up to a shop vac. It'll pull a vacuum through this needle. Uh, somebody else was uh, using a handheld uh, Dirt Devil vacuum cleaner. Anything that'll, that'll pull a suction um, through this tube. And the nice thing about that is if you do that, then you don't need to have this particulate trap because you don't have to worry about getting stuff into um, your vacuum pump. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna take, now what you do is you just gently, right at the very corner, poke this into the bag without going through both layers. You just want it through the top layer of the bag. Okay, put my finger over it and turn it on and watch it. I gotta be careful. There. Now I could have gone a lot, uh, a lot deeper vacuum on that, but then I would have crushed the taco shells, and I don't want to do that. Now with the hole here, you want to isolate that hole. I come over here, grab my sealer. And that hole is closed. And there you have it. There's 10 tacos with all the fillings. Okay. One more time. We will do the tostadas. And you know something? These containers, you can get these in different sizes. I think this one will hold up to a 10 inch. And it might even hold a, t a two 10 inches or at least one 10 inch and one 12 inch. If you've got delicate things that you want to vacuum pack, I mean, even if you're sending cookies through the mail and you want to make sure that they are well packed and uh, they're vacuum packed so to maintain the freshness or something, you can pack them in something like this. Um, some people will say, well, what about a cookie tin? Uh, they're made of metal, yeah, but they're very flimsy. I tried it, it crushes the can with with almost no vacuum at all. So a cookie tin, uh, it just it just doesn't have this much uh, rigidity to it. But this is a great idea for vacuum packing and and maybe storing things that you want to protect from oxygen, but at the same time, um, and air and water and everything, but at the same time, you want to. Uh, be able to store it away and and have it so that it can be well packaged without being bothered. Oh, one more thing. People say, Evan, what about them, their freezer bags? Isn't that plastic? Aren't you afraid of that deteriorating inside of those bags oh, after a year or two? Well, I don't know of anybody that hasn't seen one of these plastic bags after having been um, in a dump or someplace where it is exposed to heat and sunlight that hasn't literally fallen apart. And that's very true. If these bags were going to be exposed to heat and sunlight, they would not last. But there's no heat and sunlight inside this bag. And when you think about it, what is the one thing that people are, are really up in arms about when it comes to landfills? What they're up in arms about is how long it takes for plastic to deteriorate once it's buried in a landfill. The last estimate that I got was 400 years. So no, these freezer bags are just fine for this purpose. You don't have to worry about these freezer bags. These freezer bags will go in there and they will last, well, they'll outlast, and they'll outlast you. They can go in there for literally 200, 300 years. It'll outlast the food. So don't worry about using plastic bags in your storage. As long as those plastic bags aren't subjected to sunlight, it's mainly sunlight, but heat combined with sunlight will also do it. Okay? So here we go. This one go in here like this. And this one. Kind of a little bit. It'll sit next to those vegetables and whatnot. 
got to make sure that we put the oxygen absorber in there and the instructions make sure they're the correct ones yeah these are for the tostadas and then last but not least is the refried beans now this one I will lay flat on top of the meat and the vegetables everything's in there we're ready to seal done take this corner one layer right into the bag turn this on and there's that Okay, take the heat sealer, seal in front of that hole, and now that is good for 25 years, and you can be sure those tostadas in there are not damaged. So there you have it. Um, now I'm going to show you a picture, um, because I can edit it, I'm going to take these down, I'm going to put it with all of the others. And this is the picture. This is the end result of this entire project. Take a look at this. What you see there is 70 to or tacos in seven 10 taco packages and 40 tostadas in four uh, 10 tostada packages. Completely sealed and completely ready for storage. They will last for a very, very long time. 25 or more years and and even beyond that when you when you ask yourself just what it is that is damaging food so anyhow I've got the stuff in the freezer there it's going to go into the freeze dryer here probably tomorrow morning and I will figure out something I'm going to do with it once it's done but uh, I hope you've enjoyed watching this video I hope you've learned something about the difference between um, uh, 90 10 meat and uh, 7327 and the fact that you're actually getting the same amount of, you're actually paying basically the bottom line is you're actually paying the same amount for the red meat protein you get and you never know what's going to be in that cheaper beef okay people will tell you manufacturers will tell you scientists will tell you the federal government will tell you the food and drug administration will tell you everybody will tell you exactly what's in that meat but I don't believe it you can if you want. I don't believe it. I think when it comes right down to it, that meat is expensive, and if it doesn't sell, it's going to get put into a, it, it, they're going to make hamburger out of it, and then to, uh, you don't want to take filet mignon and make hamburger out of it without increasing the fat and, and the fillers and the water and everything else in it so that you can recover your money, okay? They have to do it. And because of the government, they have to tell you that they don't do it. Uh, I'm not claiming anybody to do it. I'm not pointing any fingers or anything. I believe it. I believe it happens all the time. So I always either grind my own meat, and if it needs fillers, when I'm making a meatloaf or if I'm making a hamburger and I need to add a little fat, maybe I'll get a a, a fattier cut of meat. But um, that way I do it. I know what's in it. I don't have to wonder. I know that there's no meat slime in it, uh, which is processed undesirable cuts of meat and fat to adjust the fat, the fat content of your hamburger, okay? So with that, I hope that you'll like and subscribe to my page. Um, also, as usual, there is my photographic web page. I hope you'll take a look at my photography. I do uh, professional photography and I, I try to do different things, not just go out and take pictures of, of people and landscapes. I, I try to do different things. I hope you'll take a look, especially at my fireworks and my water drop photography and landscape. But um, take a look at that. Tell me what you think. And subscribe, like, hit the notification bell because I'm always coming up with something new. And I try to do things different. I try to do things that nobody else does. So with that, I'm Evan Rowell. And this is Critical Thinking. 
about tacos.